freezing cold, oppressive heat, devastating drought. Extreme climate change may have contributed to the extinction of the Neanderthals and allowed modern Homo sapiens to dominate the Earth. All life on Earth is subject to the power of climate. Civilizations evolve or vanish forever. Favorable climatic conditions support the rise of great empires and promote trade, prosperity and artistic achievement. Adverse climatic events often lead to war and other human catastrophes. Almost 14 billion years ago, immense forces created the universe. The Big Bang spawned vast galaxies, each with millions and millions of stars, moons and planets. Among these is one small blue planet, our Earth. Water, warmth and the Earth's protective atmosphere create something that may be unique in the universe, a climate that makes life possible. As the oceans formed and the continents drifted apart, the Earth developed seasons. Temperature differences between land and water produced winds and land bridges shaped the ocean currents. But climate has always been prone to sudden change, often with dramatic consequences for life on Earth. 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs were the unchallenged masters of the prehistoric world, until their sudden demise. A meteor strike triggered volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. The ensuing climatic chain reaction wiped out the giant reptiles. After the age of the dinosaurs, the Earth cooled. Climate change also affected our ancestors. Early hominids had to survive periods of both extreme heat and extreme cold. Most were unable to adapt and died out. Then, over thousands of years, the polar ice caps expanded. As did the Earth's alpine glaciers. Around 60,000 BC, average temperatures were about five degrees colder than they are today. This had a huge impact. Arctic sheet ice extended all the way to Europe. So much water was frozen that sea levels became up to 100 metres lower. The icy temperatures also affected the land. The ground was not only frozen solid, but also extremely dry. Where the ice ended, there were stretches of tundra and taiga. If you look at Western Europe as a place to live, you find that there are two challenges. One, you find that you have very cold conditions, particularly in winter, but during the summer, because the ice is so far south, you have this wonderful sort of like high energy environment. So it doesn't stay stable for a very long period. And you have this sort of oscillating extremes going through the ice age, which then stress any creatures that are living there at that time. But one hominid genus was resistant to these stresses. The Neanderthals were suited to these extreme conditions. They not only survived the climatic variations, but developed an impressive range of skills. Neanderthals were adept at hunting large animals and knew how to light fires. 
They were the first hominids to develop successful strategies for coping with climatic variation. Stellen Sie sich heute Sommer vor, in dem es nur gerade mal so 10 Grad warm wird. Das sind, das sind ganz andere Lebensbedingungen. Ne? Dann leben wir hier in unseren Regionen wie heute nördlich des Polarkreises. In the Neanderthals' caves, fires kept temperatures constant. They made warm clothes from animal skins. The key thing for surviving cold climates is to avoid frostbite. So the key things that you want to actually protect in cold climates, of course, your fingers, your toes, your nose, and of course, genitalia if you happen to be a male. Neanderthals were short and stocky. Their body surface area was quite small relative to their body mass, but they had lots of muscle, which generates heat. They had the perfect anatomy for surviving in an ice age. The Neanderthals' main problem was their diet. They needed to consume large quantities of meat to sustain their muscle mass. So they preferred to hunt large animals. In summer, when the ice receded for a few weeks, they hunted mammoth and other big game. Hunting was physically demanding and dangerous, but Neanderthals needed animal protein and vitamins to survive the long winters. They often tracked their prey over long distances. When you look at a Neanderthal, they are tough, they are cold adapted, and you would expect them to survive and thrive in the ice ages. And they did thrive while the climate was stable. But then, quite suddenly, it changed. The climate has always been subject to large but predictable fluctuations. Most of these are caused by the sun, the center of our solar system. As the Earth revolves, the sun's rays strike its surface. At some times, its orbit is more circular, at others, more elliptical. One orbital cycle takes 100,000 years. The angle of the Earth's axis also moves in a 40,000-year cycle. These changes cause regular climatic variations on Earth as the intensity of solar radiation increases and decreases. Other influences on the Earth's climate, such as fluctuations in sea currents, are irregular. The Gulf Stream, for example, works like a giant heat pump, moving warm water towards Europe. Ja, der Golfstrom ist mit Sicherheit das wichtigste Klimaelement, was wir überhaupt haben. Die anderen Elemente im Klimasystem, wie die Sonneneinstrahlung, verändern maximal das Klima um zwei Grad. Wenn der Golfstrom anspringt oder äh, schwach wird, das sind im Nordatlantik Veränderungen von 8 Grad, 6 bis 8 Grad. Das ist einfach viel, viel mehr. Climatologists are investigating how changes in the Gulf Stream affected the Neanderthals. The answers lie hidden in Germany's Eiffel Mountains, deep in the lakes that have formed in Mar, the craters of extinct volcanoes. These scientists are doing pioneering work. They use sophisticated technology to reconstruct the Earth's prehistoric climate from its own natural records. Using a special drill, they're taking core samples from the sediment of Mar lakes in the Eiffel Mars region. For thousands of years, pollen has settled in these oxygen-poor waters and been perfectly preserved. For scientists, the lakes provide a unique climatic record. The core samples are fragile. They have to be frozen with liquid nitrogen so they don't disintegrate on their way to the surface. Every sample that's brought up intact opens a door to the past. The pollen layers allow the scientists to draw conclusions about climatic conditions thousands of years ago. The Earth never forgets, 
and the climate leaves a unique footprint. After. Now the research team from the University of Mainz can start reading the Climate Chronicle. Das Besondere an diesen Kernen aus den Seen der Mare ist, dass wir keinen Sauerstoff im Bodenwasser hier haben und deswegen jede einzelne Jahresschicht erhalten bleibt. Und wie in einem Tagebuch können wir Schicht für Schicht analysieren und Schicht für Schicht das Klima des jeweiligen Jahres rekonstruieren. The older the period they want to investigate, the deeper the scientists need to drill. One millimeter of the sample equals one year. A metre-long sample takes them back in time 1,000 years. At a depth of 40 metres, the researchers reach the era of the Neanderthals. The Eiffel Mars are an ideal location for this research because the Neanderthals lived in this region. The Neander Valley, where the first Neanderthal skeleton was found, is just 150 kilometres away. The core samples reveal what conditions were like for the Neanderthals when the Gulf Stream became erratic. The dark layers of earth indicate periods with mild climates and extensive forest cover. Lighter layers indicate periods when barren steppes covered the area and summers were four degrees colder than today. About 60,000 years ago, the climate changed suddenly, with dramatic consequences for the Neanderthals. Also wir sehen, dass es ganz schnelle Änderungen in dem Klima gegeben hat. Die warmen Phasen und die kalten Phasen wechseln ganz abrupt ab. Und in zehn Jahren springt das hier. There were ten cold and hot phases in quick succession. The landscape and the vegetation changed rapidly. Humans and nature were under constant stress. This climate chaos pushed the Neanderthals to their limits and threatened their very existence. The Neanderthaler had to this time in a Waldvegetation äh, gelebt. Und in zehn Jahren befindet er sich in einer offenen Steppe. Und sein Wild, was er normalerweise gewohnt ist zu jagen, ist nicht mehr da. Von daher sind solche schnellen Klimawechsel in zehn Jahren eine extreme Herausforderung für eine Gesellschaft, die eben halt rein auf Jagd äh, basiert. First, the Neanderthals' prey disappeared. Many animals were unable to find enough food and starved. Others migrated away. Suddenly, the Neanderthals were hunters with no prey. At the same time, a competitor moved into their territory. Homo sapiens evolved in the warm climate of East Africa and slowly migrated all the way to Europe. The newcomers seemed completely unsuited to this harsh and changeable climate. Homo sapiens was tall and slender, with long arms and legs. This build made them extremely susceptible to cold. But they overcame this disadvantage thanks to a new skill. It's been argued that Homo sapiens had a very different shoulder, so they could actually throw spears. Whereas if we look at the shoulders of Neanderthals, they're so big and chunky that actually that ability to throw probably wasn't there, and actually they were much more likely to be thrusting spears. Throwing spears allowed Homo sapiens to kill much faster animals from a distance. The revolutionary invention made hunting for meat much easier. The Neanderthals, who'd been the masters of Europe, lost their fight for survival. They weren't adaptable enough to save their species. The last of them died on the rock of Gibraltar about 24,000 years ago. The clear winner in this time of climate change was Homo sapiens. 
we still share about 99% of our genetic material with these ancient humans. After migrating to Europe from Africa, Homo sapiens spread to India and Asia, then via land bridges to Australia and America. During this mass migration, they settled in some of the most remote corners of the Earth. Key to that was the adaptability, the ability to understand the environment, how it's changing, and to work with large social groups to be able to actually deal with that changing landscape. And for me, this is the point where humans first started to adapt to the climate and use the climate for their own good. During a time of unprecedented climate chaos, humans developed a unique ability, surviving in changing climates. This allowed them to withstand the last millennia of the Ice Age, a time of extreme cold. The Ice Age gradually came to an end around 17,000 BC due to changes in the Earth's orbit. As the Earth moved closer to the Sun, life changed dramatically. the sunlight grew stronger, particularly in summer. The icy planet was about to experience a global spring. It took several thousand years for the sun to warm the entire globe. As the Earth's climate became much milder, a new era began and has continued until the present day. Warmer temperatures led to changes in the environment. First, the ice sheets in the Arctic and Antarctic began to melt. The oceans also began to warm, and the Gulf Stream began to flow again. As temperatures rose, more and more moisture evaporated into the atmosphere. This led to regular rainfall, which triggered a burst of plant growth there was increased biodiversity. Mixed forests spread across Europe and North America, and subtropical forests flourished closer to the equator. New animal species started to populate the fertile plains. Es kommt zu einem Aufblühen der Biosphäre. Die Grassteppen nehmen zu, die Tierherden nehmen zu. Der Mensch hat also eine sehr viel reichhaltigere Umwelt als am Ende der Eiszeit zur Verfügung, vor allen Dingen auch was pflanzliche Nahrungsmittel betrifft. Er gleitet sozusagen ins Paradies hinein. Along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and in the eastern Mediterranean, abundant natural resources created ideal living conditions. At the ancient site of Gebekli Tepe are 60 stone steels engraved with the images of animals, including foxes, wild boar and water birds. Nomadic peoples may have worshipped these figures because wild animals supplied them with meat and skins. Auch Sammler-Jägergesellschaften können in dieser reicheren Umwelt sich viel stärker entfalten. Das ist das Beispiel von Göbekli Tepe, wo wirklich eine reichhaltige Architektur sich entwickelt hat als Zentrum von umherziehenden noch Sammler-Jägergruppen. Aber sowas wäre in den harschen Bedingungen der Eiszeit einfach nicht möglich gewesen. Also of great benefit to humans and animals were the wild grains growing in the warm sunshine of the fertile crescent. Einkorn, Spelt and Emma grew all across the Middle East. They're among the oldest grain varieties on Earth. Easily stored, these grains could be eaten all year round and so provided humans with a reliable food source. As the seasons became more regular, humans began to cultivate these wild cereals. They observed the cycles of nature and by experimenting, 
soon learned the best times to sow crops. Agriculture revolutionised prehistoric societies. Many abandoned their nomadic lives and became farmers and cattle breeders. For the first time, humans began to settle down and build villages. They no longer needed to travel to find food. Prior to agriculture, people were hunter-gatherers and moving around, and everybody, from the very eldest to the very youngest, were all concentrating on collecting and hunting for food, because that was essential. As soon as you have the agricultural revolution and agriculture starts, suddenly not everyone is involved in food production. And allowing people to have the freedom to actually do other things allows society to build. Once they'd settled in villages, people began to specialise and develop their skills. They invented techniques that allowed them to make new, valuable objects for their communities. You have specialists who are then farmers, you have specialists who are then looking after cattle and goats and other domesticated animals, and then other people can then develop specialisations. So for example, if you're settled in one place, then you will want people who are specialised in building, so you can actually then have houses built or you can have buildings built and so you then start to free up people from the manual labour of just producing food. Pottery, metalwork and weaving changed people's lives. So did more humble inventions like bread and beer. Over the centuries villages grew into towns. One of the oldest is Jericho on the banks of the River Jordan. Other cities in the area were Chatalhuyuk, Eridu and Ur. This cradle of civilization benefited from a long period of favorable climatic conditions. Tatsächlich ist es so, dass der Beginn von Bodenbau und Viehzucht ein Quantensprung ist. Ein globaler Quantensprung der Menschheitsgeschichte, von der es nur ganz wenige gibt. Vielleicht die Ausbreitung des anatomisch modernen Menschen, die Entwicklung von Städten und die Entwicklung unserer Industriegesellschaft. Das sind wirklich die ganz großen Umbrüche, in der sich global die Menschheit verändert hat und wo wirklich neue technologische Grundlagen geschaffen worden sind, die ganz anders waren als vorher. Around the same time, a disaster was looming in North America. Part of a continental ice sheet melted and created a vast lake. It continued to grow until it covered an area of 440,000 square kilometers, far bigger than any lake existing today. The intense sunlight caused the lake to grow as more and more meltwater flowed into it from the mountains. At first, ice barriers held back this huge volume of water. But around 6,200 BC, they too began to melt, and disaster was inevitable. The barriers around Lake Agassi collapsed. A huge amount of icy water was released. It flooded large parts of North America and eventually drained into the Atlantic. The immense inflow of cold water upset the currents in the Atlantic. It disrupted the Gulf Stream, which ceased to have a warming effect. Temperatures dropped all across Europe in the Fertile Crescent, where agriculture had so recently allowed humans to make enormous progress, the weather suddenly became cold and dry. This led to devastating droughts, and crops failed. The new agrarian societies lost their livelihoods. It 
Trockenphasen sind fataler für bäuerliche Gesellschaften, einfach weil das Getreide nicht keimt oder am Halm verdorrt. Nicht? Da lässt sich dann gar nichts mehr machen. Bäuerliche Gesellschaften brauchen natürlich auch eine gewisse Regensicherheit. Da ist es so, dass diese Gesellschaften im Grunde dem Regen hinterherlaufen. The first ever climate refugees came from the eastern Mediterranean. Many thousands left in search of a new Eden. Some ventured as far as Europe, where temperatures were still relatively mild and fertile soil promised ideal conditions for settlement. Others stayed in the Middle East, but moved further south. Everywhere they went, these migrants introduced agriculture. They preferred to settle along rivers or on the coast, anywhere they had a reliable supply of fresh water and food. But even in moderate climate zones, the settlers were not safe. The dangers caused by the North American meltwater were far from over. Sea levels rose 120 meters. All over the world, humans found their very existence threatened. Gradually, the sea reclaimed vast tracts of fertile land, and rising sea levels flooded settlements in river deltas and along coasts. The Bible tells of these events in one of its best known stories. God told Noah to gather all the world's animals on his ark, two of each kind, and take them to safety. The rest of humanity was to be punished in a devastating deluge. Noah did God's bidding. If you look into almost all human societies, there are stories about the Great Flood. And the reason for this is because key period of time between 10,000 and 5,000 years ago, after the last ice age, sea levels continue to rise. And that flood, all those societies that are affected by that sea level rise, has really impinged upon our psyche and has embedded itself in our stories about the end of the world. The Bible is not the only book that tells of a great flood and an ark. The mountainous waves and the deluge that destroyed everything in its path are also vividly described in the Epic of Gilgamesh from ancient Mesopotamia and the Quran. Tribal peoples in South America also tell of a vast flood that covered the entire earth. It is said that people only survived by fleeing to the mountaintops. Indigenous Australians also refer to a great flood. The dramatic rise in sea levels thousands of years ago has become part of our collective memory. All around the world where people were, sea level rose and rose and rose until about 5,000 years. And we know that there are lots of areas that are completely flooded now that had society. So you can see cities underneath uh, the sea close to Malta and in Japan. We know that off the coast of the United Kingdom in the North Sea is Doggerland. And when you actually survey Doggerland, it has the imprint of villages of Neolithic tribes that used to live there that were flooded out. The rising sea levels changed the map of the world. In North America, Hudson Bay and the Great Lakes came into being. In Northern Europe, the Baltic Sea was formed. Japan, Indonesia and Australia became islands. The great glacial melt did not always bring devastation. One place that benefited was the Sahara. Today, it's a hot, arid and inhospitable region. But the Sahara may once have been very different. 
At an ancient site on the Gil Kabir Plateau in Egypt, archaeologists have uncovered surprising scenes from prehistoric times. They've found stenciled handprints, which were probably made by nomads or traders. An adjacent cave has rock paintings of humans standing alone and in groups. All this art was produced during the time of the Great Flood. While much of the world suffered, the Sahara appears to have been teeming with life. Many people lived here, and animal life was abundant. There were antelopes and lions, and even giraffes. What is now the world's largest sandy desert was once a fertile savanna. It was home to herds of animals that roamed rich pastures fed by a vast network of rivers and lakes. The change in this region's climate was influenced by another factor, monsoon winds. The Northern Hemisphere was receiving more heat from the sun because of a change in the tilt of the Earth's axis. Land masses store more heat than oceans, creating temperature differences that produce monsoon winds which carry cool, moist air inland. These winds brought rain and abundant life to what is now desert. If we look at the Sahara, we find that there is a huge period of time between about 12,000 years ago and five and a half thousand years ago where the Sahara was green. And by that, we mean that people were able to live there. And so we find archaeological finds all the way through the Sahara showing that people thrived there, there was clearly enough uh, food, agriculture was actually developing there, and then slowly, from about 7,000 years onwards, the Sahara started to expand. But this flowering of the Sahara and the abundance of water, wildlife and food plants was fated not to last. The fertile savanna land became a sandy desert, harsh, barren and largely uninhabited. The subtropical monsoon winds lasted only a relatively short time until the Earth's axis shifted again. As the sun's heat decreased, the monsoons lost their power. When plants die from drought, less moisture is retained in the soil. This accelerates the degradation of the land and deserts form surprisingly quickly. Wenn der Monsun ausbleibt, regnet es nicht mehr. Und da reichen sechs Wochen aus oder drei Monate und dann ist das Gras verdorrt und ist weg. Und wenn es im nächsten Jahr wieder nicht regnet und im nächsten Jahr wieder nicht regnet und dann haben sie gar keine Saat mehr, dann hat sich einfach eine Steppenlandschaft und eine Wüstenlandschaft äh, umgeformt. We know when the Sahara became a desert thanks to this ancient burial site in Niger, on what was once the shores of Lake Gobero. For many generations, the dead were buried here, along with objects such as bone fish hooks and jewellery made from hippopotamus tusks. But the burials seem to have ended quite abruptly in around 3500 BC. When the lake dried up, the inhabitants abandoned the burial site and all trace of them disappears. When the rain stopped, they had to leave. Drought had completely transformed the landscape. And this didn't just happen in the Sahara. All over the world, deserts began to form. The Taklamakan in Central Asia, Australia's Red Centre, the Namib and the Kalahari Deserts in Southern Africa.
This was the last major shift toward the Earth's current climatic patterns. That small change in the tilt of the globe caused the rains to stop in many subtropical regions. Once again, climatic change forced thousands to migrate. There was an exodus from the Sahara towards a fertile region in northern Africa. While inland rivers had dried up, the Nile in Lower Egypt was still a reliable source of water. On its banks, the migrants found fertile soils. The Nile Valley is Egypt's green heart, a verdant floodplain over 1,100 kilometres in length. The Great River provides ample water to irrigate the valley, which is surrounded by desert. Every summer, heavy rains in the Ethiopian highlands cause the river to break its banks. In September and October, the floodwaters recede, the soil dries out and the fields can be tilled. While they follow a regular yearly cycle, the Nile floods can be extreme. The early settlers had to adapt to these conditions. The climate refugees became skillful farmers and hydraulic engineers. The ancient Egyptians knew how to use every drop of the precious monsoon rains for their fields. Water flowed through a system of canals. To direct the water to where it was needed, they used locks and counterweighted buckets. This sophisticated irrigation system helped create an economic boom. The Nile made the region prosperous and fed increasing numbers of people. Egypt's first cities sprang up along the banks of the Nile. In den Flusstälern müssen jetzt viele Menschen leben. Das zwingt zur systematischen Ordnung des Lebens, zu einer straffen Organisationsform. Simple settlements soon evolved into Egypt's first kingdom. But the social and political system continued to revolve around safeguarding and managing the water supply. This was done with the help of an ingenious invention, the Nilometer, a stepped structure used to measure the level of the Nile floodwaters. The measurements were used to predict the effect of the flood each year. The Egyptian calendar was also based on this annual flooding. Arket was the season of inundation, Peret was the season of emergence, and Shemu was the harvest season. Man hat gelernt, die äthiopischen Regenfälle, die dann in den Nil hinunterströmen, nutzbar zu machen, sich nicht bedrohen zu lassen, sondern von ihnen zu profitieren. Das war die Grundlage für eine ausdifferenzierte, ertragreiche Landwirtschaft. Und dieser besondere Umgang mit dem Klima war insofern auch die Grundlage für das Entstehen der ägyptischen Hochkultur. This most famous of ancient civilizations was the product of favorable climatic conditions in the Nile Valley. The pharaohs were able to build and maintain the Egyptian empire over almost 3,000 years because the Nile provided all the necessary resources. The fundamental resource you need to build an empire is food and water. If you actually want artisans to build temples, you want soldiers to go off and fight wars for you, you have to be able to feed them and to water them. If you can ensure and protect your food supply and your water supply for all of your people, then you can start to build a large civilization. With key resources secured, the pharaohs oversaw a long period of stability. These powerful leaders were able to bring prosperity to their people. Die Hochkulturen entstehen da, wo das Klima es überhaupt zulässt oder wo das Klima die Menschen dazu treibt, Hochkulturen zu entwickeln. 
It wasn't just Egypt that flourished. Other civilizations arose between the latitudes of 20 and 40 degrees north. In Mesopotamia and Persia, in northern India, in Karakoram, in China, in Mexico and Peru, and in the Mediterranean, the Mycenaeans, Minoans, Thracians and Etruscans. All these cultures had similar climates. The kingdom of Kutna in modern-day Syria also blossomed during this period and established itself as one of the ancient world's most important economic centres. It controlled the major trade routes connecting North Africa and the Middle East. Bronze Age cultures had something else in common. Again, it was related to the climate, sun worship. Egyptians venerated the sun god. In southern England, the stone circles of Stonehenge marked the summer and winter solstices and may have been associated with sun worship. This structure in the German town of Gosek is a solar observatory. This sky disk, found in nearby Nebra, is thought to be an astronomical instrument. Many Bronze Age societies revered the sun as the giver of life. 2,000 years later, all this changed as the entire Mediterranean region entered a period that is sometimes called the Dark Ages of Antiquity. From about 1200 BC, civilizations collapsed one after the other. Sources refer to seafaring people who launched raids around the Aegean. Little is known about them, only that they always attacked from the sea. They ransacked towns and cities, leaving a trail of destruction wherever they went. From Greece to Gaza, no one was safe. Their raids marked the end of the Mediterranean civilizations of the Bronze Age. Researchers are still investigating the reasons behind the collapse of these kingdoms. They suspect that climate change may have played a role. But one of the reasons that these are called the Dark Ages is that there are so few written records dating from this time. Paleoclimatologist Dominic Fleitman hopes to shed light on this period using geological data from the Kocheyan Cave in southern Turkey. People have been visiting the cave for thousands of years because it provides not only shelter, but also water. Large pools were built in ancient times to collect the rainwater that seeps into the cave. Deeper inside the cave, this water has created a fascinating climate record, which Flightman is researching. The cave contains huge rock formations, including stalagmites up to 20 metres tall. Most are millions of years old. A walk in this cavern is also a journey through the area's climatic history. In diese Tropfsteine, das ist äh, versteinerter Regen. Und all die Informationen im Niederschlag sind in diesem Stein, Niederschlagsmenge, woher der Niederschlag kam, sind in diesem Stück Stein hier gespeichert. Und wir müssen alles daran tun, mit modernsten Labor- und Analysemethoden die Geheimnisse und diese Signaturen ähm, herauszufinden. The problem is that he needs to find just the right sample from among all these stalagmites. Many of these ancient formations stopped growing at the end of the Bronze Age, when water stopped entering the cave. Stalactites and stalagmites need a constant supply of water if they are to grow. 
They're formed by rainwater seeping through soil and dripping off rocks. The water leaves behind deposits of calcium carbonate, which accumulate over time. These fragile structures allow researchers to analyse rainfall patterns over millennia. The samples from Cochayin Cave indicate that the climate changed abruptly during the Bronze Age. Was von diesem Tropfstein sehen, ist, dass der untere Teil rechts recht weißer Kalzit ist, ohne Staubeinschlüsse, ähm, ohne Staublagen. Und ungefähr in der Mitte des Stalagmiten, ähm, ungefähr der, der Bronzezeit entsprechend, Ende der Bronzezeit entsprechend, sehen wir eine Zunahme an Staublagen. This increase in dust layers shows that during the late Bronze Age, the climate became drier. This is confirmed by the rate at which the stalagmites grew, which slowed noticeably during the period. In contrast to preceding centuries, almost no new layers of limestone were added. This suggests a decrease in rainfall around the Mediterranean from about 1200 BC. The whole region was in the grip of drought. All die Parameter, die wir gemessen haben, sagen uns trocken und kalt. Also eigentlich das perfekte um, recipe for disaster. A recipe for disaster indeed, as recurring droughts affected the entire Mediterranean region. Soon, soils were depleted. Fields could no longer be tilled. The mysterious seafarers who raided kingdom after kingdom were actually climate refugees. Huge numbers of migrants overran Egypt. Word had spread that it was rich in resources and that the pharaoh's granaries were well stocked. Ramesses III eventually won a resounding victory over the raiders. But their invasion of Egypt was the beginning of a prolonged, gradual decline. So the old kingdom ruled for hundreds and hundreds of years, and then a cold snap produced drought across the Middle East. The key problem with drought is it means that your food supply stops. If you don't have enough food, you can't feed people. Those people then either migrate to other places where there is food, or they actually start trying to produce food themselves. So what you have is every layer of government starts to collapse because you can't feed people that are trying to run the country. And you see that the old kingdom collapses. Egypt shows us the power of climate. So kingdoms fell because of a climate anomaly. Rainfall dropped substantially, and temperatures were the lowest they'd been since the end of the Ice Age. It wasn't until about 300 BC that the Earth's alignment again made the climate more favourable, with milder temperatures and regular rainfall. In the mountains, glaciers receded. The balance of nature was restored in the Mediterranean and beyond. The changes brought an end to the climate crisis and much needed relief to ecosystems all over the world, including Africa. Abundant rainfall replenished groundwater levels. Soils became fertile again and crops thrived in northern Africa. Emma, the most sought after export of the time, grew as far as the eye could see. Wir wissen, dass das in den Sommermonaten nur einige Tage waren, wo dann halt im Juni, Juli, August immer nur für fünf Tage mal Regen gefallen ist, aber das reicht dann eben halt schon, dass das Getreide wächst. This abundance attracted the attention of an emerging power, which obtained access to Africa's granaries by force. It subjugated its arch enemy Carthage in the Punic Wars. 
and secured its food supply for centuries to come. The rising imperial power was Rome. During its golden age, more than 800,000 people lived in its bustling capital on the river Tiber. Famous for both its efficient administration and its extravagant lifestyle, the Roman Empire outshone all that had come before it. So weit wir auch zurückschauen, wir sehen immer Menschen, die der Gunst der Natur folgen und die Gunst der Natur ist da, wo das Klima so ist, dass ich aus der Natur heraus leben kann, dass ich Tiere finden kann, dass ich Pflanzen finden kann und die sind klimatisch abhängig und insofern ist Menschheitsgeschichte von Beginn an Klimageschichte und auch der Beginn von Kultur und Religion ist aufs engste mit dem Klima verknüpft. At home, Rome kept its people content with bread and circuses. Abroad, it expanded its empire. The climate favoured Rome. The Earth, just before the birth of Christ. The stars were favourably aligned for life on our blue planet. For thousands of years, the Earth had been orbiting close to the Sun and receiving abundant light and heat. The sun's scorching rays were tempered by the Earth's atmosphere, which cooled them to comfortable levels. As well as the plentiful sunshine, there was also regular rainfall. In northern Egypt, emma, an ancient form of wheat, grew in abundance. Much of this grain was also used by a European power to feed its empire. Rome was the centre of a vast empire. It's remembered for decadent luxury, grandiose architecture and the lavish spectacles that entertained its people. This extravagance was possible because of favourable climatic conditions. So if you look at climate and what is, you could perceive as good climate, what you really want is enough water throughout the year. So you can have agriculture, so you have enough drinking water, but also what you need is stability. So what you really want is the weather to be the same each year so you can plan. The growth rings of ancient oaks tell today's researchers that around 100 BC the weather was very stable and that temperatures were rising gradually. Average temperatures were about 2 degrees centigrade warmer than in previous centuries. For almost 300 years, climatic conditions were ideal for strong, stable growth. The small rise in temperature had a huge impact on the Northern Hemisphere, especially high in the mountains. Prior to this, the Alps had stopped the Roman Empire expanding northwards. But the higher temperatures caused glaciers to melt. Mountain passes were no longer covered in ice and snow, allowing Roman troops easy passage. Es ist deswegen vielleicht kein Zufall, dass sich das Römische Reich gerade in dieser Zeit in die nordalpinen Gebiete ausdehnt, also nach Germanien, nach Britannien. Da kann man auch wieder einen Zusammenhang mit dem Klima sehen. The Romans took advantage of the mild climate. Their troops crossed the Alps effortlessly and in large numbers. Nothing stood in the way of their conquest of Germania. Once over the Alps, their superior combat techniques made the Roman legions invincible. Region after region came under fire. The Germanic tribes didn't stand a chance. At the height of its power, the Roman Empire extended from Britain to the Caspian Sea and the Persian Gulf and had 50 million inhabitants. But the Romans weren't the only ones taking advantage of the climate. 
China was also experiencing a golden age. Along the Yangtze River, rice grew in abundance. The invention of agricultural irrigation systems improved people's living conditions, as did the use of draft animals. After numerous military campaigns, Qin Shi Huangdi united all the warring states under his rule in 221 BC. China became an empire. The Chinese emperor, like his Roman counterpart, pursued an expansionist policy. That made him enemies. The Qin Empire soon began work on the fortifications now known as the Great Wall of China. The wall was built of rammed earth and stone and was meant to protect the empire against hostile nomadic tribes in the north. The Romans used wood to build the walls that marked their imperial borders. The Limus Germanicus, which stretched for over 550 kilometers, controlled the flow of trade and defended the empire against enemy raids. All along the Limus were watchtowers manned with legionnaires. But that was not enough to protect Rome from a long series of battles with Germanic tribes. With its dense forests, the Germanian terrain proved a challenge for the Romans. And they weren't used to the heavy rainfall in these northern latitudes. In 9 AD, three Roman legions entered the Teutoburg forest. It had been raining for days and the ground was muddy. The dense undergrowth meant they couldn't march in combat formation. They walked straight into an ambush. The great thing about the actual Roman Empire was its standardization. It standardized the way people made roads, how the army marched and how they fought. The problem is that they were used to engage armies on sort of like a battlefield. However, when you're fighting in dense forest, in mud, with huge amounts of rainfall, suddenly all of that breaks down. So there's no organization. You're then fighting one-on-one. -on -one. And that gave the Germanic tribes the edge because they were used to this running, hit-and-run battle approach in the dense forest. The Germanic attackers' fighting equipment was lighter and better suited for close combat. The Germanic tribes were very clever. They used the weather to their advantage to win the battle. They could fight in the forest in appalling conditions with huge amounts of rainfall and lots of mud. And they knew that that weather, that climate, would actually give them the advantage over the Romans who were used to working in teams and also in heavy armor and were using a large shield and a short stabbing sword. The legionnaires didn't stand a chance. The Battle of the Teutoburg Forest was the Romans' greatest defeat. They no longer believed in their own invincibility and never again attempted to conquer Germanic territory east of the Rhine. Das Römische Reich war in seiner Blütezeit riesig. Es hatte fast keine Gegner mehr zu bekämpfen. Aber langfristig sollte ein Gegner so stark sein, dass noch nicht mal die Römer dagegen siegen konnten. Und das war die Klimaveränderung. Climate change is influenced by astronomical forces. It depends on the Earth's orbit around the Sun, the tilt of the Earth's axis, and the level of solar activity, all of which vary. Sometimes the Earth's orbit is almost circular, at others more elliptical. One orbital cycle takes 100,000 years. During a 40,000 year cycle, the angle of the Earth's axis also changes. These variations cause regular changes in the Earth's climate, as the intensity of solar radiation increases and decreases. 
at about the time of Christ's birth, solar radiation probably decreased. The Gulf Stream cooled and the Earth's climate became much colder. Crops died all across North Africa when the summer rains failed. Rome's granaries were empty. Climate change hit the empire at its most vulnerable point. If you look at the stresses of the Roman Empire and you look at whether it was the Republic or the Emperors, the one thing that they worried about was food. And you see many accounts of rioting in Rome when there wasn't enough food. If you're an emperor in charge of an empire, you have to remember only one thing. Unhappy people cause revolution. The people of Rome rebelled. For their rulers, the timing couldn't have been worse. The huge empire was already weakened by corruption and political discord. The outer reaches of the empire were also affected. Freezing cold winters led to hunger in many places. The northern provinces were worst hit. This bog mummy from northern Germany provides evidence of these extreme conditions. The adolescent's body was found by peat cutters in 1952 near the town of Winderby. Because of its slight build, the body was long thought to be that of a girl. But recent examination of the bones has revealed that they belong to a 14-year-old boy. They also tell us why he was so small. The arm and leg bones show evidence of years of poor nutrition. His growth was stunted, and in some years he didn't grow at all. For 12 of his 14 years, the boy was severely malnourished. It's likely that many others in Germania also went hungry, as the cold, unstable climate made living conditions more hostile. When invading Huns started to compete with Germanic tribes for the few remaining resources, they were forced to flee. A mass migration began. As they moved south, they displaced others. Soon, hundreds of thousands of climate refugees were slowly advancing on the Roman Empire. The harsh climate had at least one advantage. Frozen swamps and rivers were easy to cross and allowed the migrants to pass through Roman borders. Diese zugefrorene Flüsse waren für die Völkerwanderung eine ganz wesentliche Geschichte, weil die Reichsgrenze, die römische Reichsgrenze plötzlich einfach passierbar war. Vorher gab es nur Brücken und da saßen die römischen Legionen, konnten alles kontrollieren. In dem Augenblick, wo der Rhein zufriert, kann man einfach mit Zehntausenden von Menschen reinziehen ins römische Reich und genau das hat eben halt auch stattgefunden. In 406 AD, almost 90,000 people crossed the Rhine near Mainz and entered the Roman Empire. More and more tribes invaded, conquered and settled Roman territory. This spelled the end for the once powerful empire. As Europe entered the Middle Ages, the climate was still unstable particularly the spring of 536. The sun suddenly darkened and temperatures dropped. A Byzantine scholar reported that the sun gave forth its light without brightness and seemed like the sun in eclipse. According to Chinese sources, there were summer snows, drought and famine. Irish monks also reported crop failures. For a long time, the darkened sun remained a mystery. Today, though, most experts agree on what caused it. 
Wir bemerken das Klima eigentlich nur, wenn es sich abrupt verändert. Also zum Beispiel, wenn ein äh, großer Vulkanausbruch sich für einige Jahre auf das Klima auswirkt und es dadurch kälter wird. A cataclysmic event did take place in 536. The Ilopango volcano in what is now El Salvador erupted, leaving a caldera 17 kilometers wide and killing 100,000 people. Climatologist Robert Dull sees a connection between the eruption of Ilopango and the darkening of the sun that was observed at the time. He believes the volcano caused the climate crisis in the early Middle Ages. The volcano is basically the lake. What you see here is an outline of the entire area that was erupted all at once when this volcano erupted 1,500 years ago. The lake's dimensions suggest the size of the magma chamber at the time of the eruption. It's 270 meters deep, with walls over 400 meters high. It covers a total area of over 72 square kilometers. The eruption must have been immense. The dimensions of this vast crater are an indication that Ilopango could have been one of the world's few supervolcanoes. Robert Dull wants to prove that Ilopango was big enough to trigger climate change. To do that, he needs to analyse the volcanic ash, which can reveal a great deal about the eruption. The ash from Ilopango can still be found all around the lake. In some places, it forms towering cliffs. The colour of the ash holds the key. Ilopango ash is very light, an important fact according to Dull. The lighter the ash, the higher the silica content. Only high energy eruptions produce ash containing large quantities of silica. When we find an ash that's light in colour like this, it's very exciting for someone like me because what it tells us is that it's both high in silica and that it was erupted explosively in a geologic instant. It might have been a day, might have been two days, but a huge amount of material was erupted all at once, which tells us of the strength and magnitude and sheer immensity of this event. The greater a volcano's explosive forces, the more ash deposited in its immediate vicinity, and the further afield the ash is spread. Some of the Ilopango ash cliffs are up to 400 metres high. But Dull has found Ilopango ash a lot further afield. It formed hills, now overgrown by jungle. The origin of these hills is clear from the pumice stones Dull digs up. What we learn from these deposits is um, just the tip of the iceberg, really. Most of the material, by far, the far, the great majority of this material is outside of the caldera, not just on the margins of the caldera, but many hundreds of kilometers away. Ash from Ilopango is found not only in El Salvador, but also in Honduras, Nicaragua, and Guatemala, and at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Even core samples from the Arctic and Antarctic ice sheets contain ash from the 536 eruption. The amount of material that was erupted during the eruption of Ilopango was at least 84 cubic kilometres, a massive amount of rock thrown into the atmosphere at once. Some of that material would have blasted horizontally onto the landscape, but a large amount would have gone up through the lower atmosphere into the stratosphere. When that happens, 
the climate cools, which is exactly what happened after the Ilopango eruption. During the eruption, enormous quantities of ash and sulfur dioxide were propelled into the stratosphere. For months, these fine particles floated at an altitude of 25 kilometers. Ilopango lies close to the equator. From there, winds carried the ash and sulfurous gases to both the North and South Poles. Within weeks, the blue planet was enveloped in a cloud of ash that blocked virtually all sunlight. What the ancient chroniclers observed was a volcanic winter. It lasted for 18 months and made the natural environment much more inhospitable. The ash cloud not only blocked the sun, but also brought cold and rain. It had a devastating effect on human populations. Harvests failed, stored food rotted, people were hungry and weak and succumbed easily to bubonic plague. The volcanic winter ended, but the plague did not. Millions of people fell ill. In the 14th century, over one third of Europe's population fell victim to the Black Death. Nature recovered more quickly than humans. After the volcanic winter, it reclaimed its territory. Only a few decades later, dense forests had grown across vast swathes of Europe. These forests were wild places where people only ventured to graze stock or collect wood. In the early Middle Ages, the forests were the home of wild animals. In them, wolves found shelter and room to roam. They were feared and hated as man-eating monsters. As were bears, another forest dweller. Der antike Mensch im römischen Germanien hatte die Natur fast beherrscht. Im frühen Mittelalter wird die Natur immer stärker und der Mensch fürchtet sich vor der Natur. Die Natur wird zur Bedrohung. Der Wald wird wieder bevölkert von Tieren, die in der römischen Zeit viel weniger verbreitet gewesen sind. Das sind vor allem Bär und Wolf, wahrscheinlich auch Wildkatze. Es ist gefährlich, in den Wald zu gehen. Der Mensch braucht aber den Wald, weil er seine Schweine zur Mast in den Eichenwald treibt. Sheep and goats also grazed in the forests. They were easy prey for hungry wolves. Forests became a symbol of an all-powerful nature, and fear became the overpowering emotion of the time. Da ist die Angst vor einer Welt, in der man nicht mehr leben kann. Da ist eine neue Ausrichtung hin zu Gott. Da ist eine größere Spiritualität. Itinerant monks from Ireland began preaching Christianity across Europe in the sixth century. It spread across the continent at the same time as forest and wilderness. Baptism gave believers the promise of a merciful God who would save their immortal souls. Such teachings gave people hope in difficult times. In China, Buddhism became established. The years of devastating drought after the Ilopango eruption contributed to the spread of Buddhist teachings. Starving farmers found comfort in the possibility of being reborn into a more prosperous and happier life. Islam spread through conquest. According to some experts, Muslims began their military campaigns after a long drought on the Arabian Peninsula. In the 8th century, Islam came to Spain. 
but climatic conditions did not deteriorate everywhere on Earth. Weather patterns around the equator were almost perfect. Regular monsoon rains drenched the fertile soil. These ideal conditions saw the rise of prosperous and powerful kingdoms. In Central America, the Mayans built new cities. Many of them were home to over 10,000 people. In Peru, the Nazca civilization was based on the cultivation of corn, manioc and sweet potato. They created huge geoglyphs, which may have been intended to thank their gods for plentiful harvests. Then the monsoons failed. Fields became deserts. The Nazca drew even larger pictures in the earth, perhaps hoping to appease the gods. Other places also became drier. The Mayans also felt the effects of a changing climate. Around 900 AD, they abandoned their great cities. Prolonged drought threatened their culture. The Nazca were also struggling to survive. There's speculation that they became climate refugees, moving higher into the Andes. Astronomers now have an explanation as to why the climate became so warm and dry at this time. The reason was solar activity. The sun continuously produces vast amounts of energy, which are released on its surface in the form of solar flares and geomagnetic storms. This heat energy affects the amount of solar radiation that reaches the Earth. This radiation is strong at some times and weaker at others. This is because solar activity is always fluctuating. Dark patches on the sun's surface indicate how much energy is being produced. The more patches, the higher the solar activity. The number of sunspots peaks every 11 years. Such a peak occurred in 800 AD. Solar activity was at maximum levels and solar radiation particularly intense. The Earth began to heat up. The North Atlantic, which had been covered in solid pack ice, became navigable all year round. A thaw set in from the Arctic to the European mainland, opening the way for seaborne invaders. The Vikings reached Britain at the end of the 8th century. They came to plunder. With their attack on Lindisfarne Priory in northern England, the Vikings stormed into history. Soon they were feared all across Europe as bloodthirsty raiders. But the Vikings were also pioneers and explorers. The mild climate allowed them to sail west across the North Atlantic. The Vikings, when they went exploring, were taking advantage of the medieval warm period. And during this warm period, the Gulf Stream was actually coming much further north, and giving much more warmth to Western Europe. But it also what it allowed was the retreat of sea ice. So the sea ice that usually comes to at least Iceland during the winter was much further to the north, which allowed the Vikings to not only sail all the way around to um, Mediterranean and to exchange uh, goods with the civilizations there. It also then encouraged the uh, exploration of the rest of the world. Wherever melting snow and ice had uncovered virgin soils, the Vikings settled. First, they discovered Iceland. At the time, it was almost ice-free and uninhabited. In 985, 
the Viking seafarers reached the next milestone in their westward expansion, Greenland. They built large settlements along the coasts and rivers. Because of that warmer climate, you could actually grow crops. So all the agriculture from Scandinavia, they could literally just transport and take to Iceland and to Greenland. The warmer weather allowed the Norsemen to make another, even bolder voyage of discovery right across the Atlantic. Around 1000 AD, Leif Eriksson reached Newfoundland, almost 500 years before the voyage of Christopher Columbus. Meanwhile, temperatures in Europe continued to rise as the increased solar activity continued. The landscape became a sea of colour as temperatures rose. Forests began to grow at altitudes above 2,000 metres. Grain and other crops could be grown even at high altitudes. The dark years of hardship and hunger were over. Conditions for agriculture were the best they'd been for centuries. Farmers began using new technology to increase their yields. Knowledge of the harness spread from Asia to Europe. It allowed horses to pull more weight and till larger fields. The seasons were reliable. Spring, summer, autumn and winter came and went in a predictable pattern. The first weather forecasts were folk sayings based on farmers' observations of the seasons. Das Schlimmste, was passieren kann, ist, dass wir jedes Jahr was anderes haben. Aber wenn das Wetter einigermaßen stabil ist, dann kann man von einem Jahr aufs nächste Jahr planen und dann kann man sich entwickeln. Agriculture became more intensive. One field was left fallow. One was used for legumes and another for grain. This three-field system was far more productive. Farmers were able to produce more than they needed, so they could trade their surplus produce. They took it to the markets in nearby towns. Demand increased, and new products were offered for sale. More and more merchants set up businesses. Village marketplaces grew into flourishing towns and cities. This set the scene for the emergence of a new social order, consisting of free citizens and wealthy merchants. Die Entstehung des Städtewesens als Antwort auf einen Klimawandel liefern die Initialzündung für ein Take-off der Menschheitsgeschichte, für ein Explodieren von Kultur und Zivilisation. Und damit ist der Grundstein gelegt für das Entstehen der modernen Welt für unsere Welt. Amsterdam, Warsaw, Freiburg, Leipzig, The Hague. Three quarters of Europe's cities arose during the favourable climatic conditions of the High Middle Ages. Venice, with its colonial empire and vast trade network, was Europe's source for goods from many foreign lands. It wasn't long before Western Europe began to use coins. First ones that were valued by weight, and later the standard silver denarius. Increasing prosperity created the foundation for education, the arts and culture. Europe's first universities were founded in Bologna, Paris and Oxford. The moderate climate 
inspired a new architectural style. Gothic churches had large windows to let the sun in. Construction of Cologne Cathedral began in 1248. Slim arches and stained glass windows dominate the soaring presbytery. These allow light to flood the interior of the cathedral. This extraordinary building is the manifestation of a confident and optimistic society. By 1250, kingdoms had been established all over Europe. The Holy Roman Empire expanded. It conquered Sicily and was bigger than ever before. But then everything changed. Once again, climate was to make history. In the second half of the 13th century, Europe cooled significantly. The trigger for this was a number of volcanic eruptions in different parts of the world. Most of them were located along the world's largest volcanic belt, the Pacific Ring of Fire. First to erupt, in 1257 was Somalis volcano in Indonesia. Then Sicily's Mount Etna spewed fire. In 1453, the Kuwe volcano in Vanuatu exploded violently. Finally, the Laki fissure in Iceland erupted continuously for eight months. It's estimated to have been one of the deadliest eruptions in history. All these eruptions spewed ash and sulphur dioxide into the stratosphere. They affected the world's climate for almost 500 years. The mid-13th century marked the start of the longest cold period since the end of the Ice Age, more than 10,000 years before. In Europe, the effects of this little ice age were described by monks, town scribes and chroniclers in thousands of documents. Climatologist Rudiger Glaser has studied these historical sources. They describe vividly the devastating consequences of periods of extreme cold, as well as other natural disasters. These illustrated broadsheets from Flanders depict floods that hit Central Europe on an unprecedented scale in 1342. Thousands perished in what was known as St Mary Magdalene's Flood. In 1342, it was the hydrologic GAU, the largest water in the last years. Mit verheerenden Folgen. Es waren damals alle Brücken weggerissen worden. Es sind ganze Hangpartien abgerutscht. Und selbst unter Wald, wo man einfach so eine gewisse Schutzwirkung normalerweise erkennen kann, gab es Schluchtenreisen. Haben sich also kleine, nichtssagende Bächlein zu tiefen Schluchten vertieft und erweitert. There were destructive floods from Cologne to Vienna, from the Rhine to the Danube. In Frankfurt, the Main River rose to almost eight metres. Along the Danube alone, over 6,000 people drowned. But the chroniclers didn't only record catastrophic floods. In the summer of 1586, the citizens of Ghent feared for their lives. A ferocious storm struck the city. People and even buildings were washed away. The terrified populace believed that demonic forces were at work.
but the terrifying tempest of August 1586 was not caused by demons. Es zeigen sich dämonische Gestalten, die Häuser und Personen emporreißen, so dass der Verdacht sehr nahe liegt, dass das hier sogar ein Tornado ist, der abgebildet wurde. Evidence suggests it was a tornado that tore through Ghent. The storm had long-term effects on the city's inhabitants because essential structures had been destroyed. Man hat oft ein, zwei Generationen gebraucht, um die Schäden von solchen Großereignissen wieder zu kompensieren, die Brücken wieder zu bauen, die Mühlen wieder zu bauen, die Wehre einzurichten. People believed that God was punishing them by sending all these natural disasters. During the 500 years of the Little Ice Age, unstable climatic conditions made life a daily struggle for survival. Und sie waren in der Tat in jeder Generation von Witterungsextremen und von Unwettern und von Klimakatastrophen betroffen. Und das hat natürlich die Menschen tief beeindruckt. Und sie haben tatsächlich dann das Gefühl gehabt, Doomsday, Weltuntergang ist angesagt. But it was not only extreme weather events that caused suffering. The key problem with the Little Ice Age is the actual cold conditions. After the population growth of the medieval warm period, where there seemed to be abundant food for this growing population, the Little Ice Age had a huge effect. The growing season for crops was much shorter, and the climate was much colder. And so you find that as the Little Ice Age uh, starts, you get famine throughout Western Europe. It had a profound effect on human society, and there were lots and lots of deaths through starvation. Records show that sometimes everything just stopped. This happened in the German town of Augsburg in 1658. Das Monat Sena und Februari hat es so hart geschneit und gewehet, dass man nicht hat wandeln können, desgleichen alle Mahlmühlen, Hammer- und Sägmühlen eingefroren sind, dass man lange Zeit nicht hat arbeiten können. Not only were summers too cold for good harvests, but also much too wet. Continual rain caused seeds and crops to go mouldy and spoil. Famine killed many and weakened those who survived. They succumbed quickly when the plague returned. Europe's population had soared during the High Middle Ages, but now it fell by one third in just one century. Desperate people sought an explanation for their misery. Die kleine Eiszeit hat sich für viele Menschen als eine ausgesprochene Zeit der Krise dargestellt. In der Krise haben sie häufig einen wirtschaftlichen Schaden. Und wenn sie einen wirtschaftlichen Schaden erleiden und die Mechanismen nicht erkennen, dann suchen sie einen Schuldigen. In der kleinen Eiszeit ist es kein Zufall, dass man gerade zu dieser Zeit eine viel stärkere Hexenverfolgung hat, die insofern in einem ursächlichen Zusammenhang zum Klimawandel steht. The witch hunts targeted people on the margins of society. Many of those accused of having made a pact with the devil were lower class, elderly and female. Wir wissen das äh, zum Leider aus den Folterprotokollen. Da wurden die Armen dann äh, unter der Folter halt gefragt, wie sie das Unwetter gemacht haben. Also wie haben sie jetzt den Hagelschlag äh, herbeigeführt, der die Reben zerschlagen hat? wie das Unwetter gemacht, wie die Überschwemmung hervorgerufen. Und unter der Folter haben die leider dann halt die Sachen, die ihnen vorgeworfen wurden, auch bekannt. Und damit war man sozusagen gefestigt und war der Überzeugung, dass sie halt auch die Ursache waren und die Übeltäter und Übeltäterinnen mit allen grausamen Konsequenzen der Hexenverbrennung und der Tötung. During the witch hunt sparked by the Little Ice Age, Around 60,000 innocent people were burned at the stake. But the weather didn't change. Temperatures continued to drop. Glaciers advanced all across North America and Europe. Many people abandoned villages and farms in the mountains because of avalanches, landslides, and glacial ice.
near the town of Chamonix in the French Alps, for example, glaciers engulfed whole villages. Elsewhere, they cut off important supply routes. In Greenland and Iceland too, massive glaciers were encroaching. The ongoing climate crisis was reflected in the political climate. Unrest spread throughout Europe. The second defenestration of Prague caused the collapse of the uneasy peace between the European powers and marked the beginning of the Thirty Years' War. Soon, most of Europe was involved. The war was mostly fought within the Holy Roman Empire. In some places, up to two-thirds of the population died, and not just on the battlefields. Most casualties were civilians. Woran sterben denn die Leute, wenn man sich die damaligen Waffen anschaut? Also diese Gewehre, Musketen, die waren ja oft äh, gefährlicher für den, der damit rumgespielt hat, als für den Feind. Und äh, die großen Todeszahlen, auf die wir eigentlich kommen, die äh, kommen meistens durch äh, Epidemien, durch Seuchen zustande. Also es gibt große äh, Pestepidemien, es gibt Typhusepidemien, es gibt Pocken, oft auch in Kombination äh, miteinander oder mit anderen Krankheiten, Erkältungskrankheiten. Und äh, das sind sozusagen die äh, Ereignisse, die äh, ganz, äh, halbe Städte sterben lassen. Es ist nicht der Krieg, der zu diesen großen Todeszahlen führt, sondern es ist eigentlich die Klimaungunst dieser Jahre. In France, cold, damp weather caused repeated crop failures. In Paris, the price of bread and other staples soared. The situation soon escalated. Die Menschen werden nicht mehr so stabil versorgt. Periodische Hungersnöte sind an der Tagesordnung und die Lebenserwartung sinkt rapide. The well-fed members of the aristocracy were far removed from the concerns of their people. By the time the nobility realized how explosive the situation had become because of this lack of basic supplies, it was too late. Das Klima kann für politische Systeme oder auch für einzelne Machthaber eine unglaubliche Herausforderung sein, wo wir Missernten haben, wo wir ungünstige klimatische Veränderungen haben. Da verliert Bevölkerung das Vertrauen zu den Herrschern und es kommt zur Revolution. Das französische Königshaus musste 1789 diese Erfahrung ganz besonders bitter machen. On the 14th of July 1789, Paris reached boiling point. Armed citizens stormed the Bastille. The guards were forced to capitulate. The attack marked the start of the French Revolution. In the years to come, the royal family and many other members of the nobility were executed by guillotine. The French people overthrew the monarchy and democracy returned to Europe for the first time in 2,000 years. One slogan from the French Revolution was liberty, equality and fraternity, now France's national motto. In 1815, the Little Ice Age entered a final dark phase, triggered by another geological disaster. Indonesia's Mount Tambora erupted. The massive explosion ejected almost twice as much material as Ilopango in 536, including vast clouds of fine ash that remained in the atmosphere for months. There was a, a large fraction that went straight up into the upper atmosphere. That ash worked its way around the globe uh, in the upper atmosphere as a dust veil, and that dust veil reflected the sun's uh, radiation uh, in a way that would cause climate cooling. 1816 was a year without a summer all over the planet. Unseasonal frost and snow caused crop failures and disastrous famines in Europe. In Germany, hunger triggered the first of three great 19th century waves of migration. 
thousands left Hamburg and crossed the Atlantic to America. Finally, the cold eased. In about 1850, a warm phase began, bringing stable, moderate temperatures. It has shaped our climate ever since. Just before this warm period began, humans embarked on a time of dramatic technological and social change. The Industrial Revolution heralded the age of machines. Ever since, technological progress has brought prosperity to industrial nations. But it has also caused human-induced climate change on an alarming and unprecedented scale. Natural disasters are nature's way of sounding the alarm bell. Our planet has heated up and is struggling to cope with global warming. For some time, scientists have been asking us to acknowledge these signs and change course. We are at that point where we can decide what sort of climate we want to have in the future. If we as a collective in the world, all the nations actually reduce climate change, that would be amazing. Because what it means is for the first time, instead of climate controlling us, our global society has decided we are going to control the climate and we are going to make sure that we have a stable climate for all future generations. All climate change affects life on Earth. Climate makes history. It always has done, and it always will.